hello. Let's get it going. Hello, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. And up there is the AI that keeps everything in check, and when they're not available, uh, everything falls apart. So that's why there might be hiccups because, well, are you there, AI? As far as I know. Good hey. evening, hometown citizens. Welcome. The music's really loud. So I'll repeat that. I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. And up there is the AI. You want to say hi again? Just because the music was really loud. Sure. Uh, good evening, hometown citizens. There you all go. Hey, so uh, we've already got all 12 of the articles that uh, are selected. Um, yeah, there isn't much preamble. I want to just get into the news um, and, uh, and, and go from there. So welcome to the show. If you are uh, watching it over on YouTube, thank you very much. Be sure to follow and ring the bell, all that, and you'll get a, a, a daily dose of the internet in 12 articles, and the show notes will lead you through hometown to the sources um, wherein you can review more information. Uh, hopefully you kind of dig this um, process. We have fun doing the show. Um, and go over to uh, wherever you use your podcast or catcher thing to catch pods. You can catch hometown as a pod catch. I heard somebody else today say, I don't want to buy anything, sell anything or process anything. And um, I thought it was entertaining. Um, but That's I don't great. Know. I you didn't don't hear up. about say anything very often. Yeah, I didn't ask. Uh, I should have asked, but um, they were very much involved in something, so I didn't bother them. Anyway, that's kind of where my brain was thinking about the whole podcast catch thing. Uh, I don't want to catch anything or pod anything or catch a pod. <laughs> okay, so we got all 12 of the articles. Uh, let's get into the very first one. And if you... Um, stumble into the room and uh, you think you have a question or a comment, then feel free to throw it into chat and we'll discuss it. Um, and if you find your way to leave a review for the podcast over in Apple's um, podcast arena, um, that would be awesome. That actually am, will help the podcast immensely um, as well as making comments over on YouTube and um I'm giving it a thumbs up. So that would be awesome. Okay. Well, anyway, let's get into the actual news. The very first article is in the hometown daily channel. There's a bunch of channels that are supposed to be uh, Twitch channels as well, but in time they will become Twitch channels. Uh, this one is uh, in hometown daily, which is this show. And, uh, the title of this first article is the first aircraft capable of flight on Mars finally makes contact with NASA after two months of radio silence. Yeah. So a, a couple of months ago, the helicopter, the little drone that they have over there, um, out, out on Mars, um, stopped communicating. Um, it had done a particularly long flight if I recall correctly and, and coming back, um, I guess it just like stopped communicating. Well, it says here in the article, NASA lost contact with Ingenuity on April 26th and did not hear from the helicopter for 63 days. The helicopter had landed out of range from the Perseverance rover, which allows it to talk to Earth. Uh, NASA now says the helicopter's 52nd flight was a success after it finally made contact. I think that's pretty amazing that I... <laughs> it is very amazing. Um, so... Before we get into the article, this is over at businessinsider.com. Uh, Katie Hawkinson is the author. Uh, okay, where has it been for 63 days? On Walkabout. It's it's just been hanging out. It met some Martians. It was, I actually have this titled Martian Makes Contact with NASA. Um, that's the little snippet for the <laughs> for the uh, show notes. 
Um, so yeah, I guess it just decided that it was just going to go, I'm going to go out and get some smokes. Went and had a beer hanging out at the pub. So apparently it landed out of range of the Perseverance Rover, which allows it to talk to earth. And then it eventually made its way home. Um, the signal means ingenuity's 52nd flight on the red planet was a success. It had launched alongside the Perseverance back in July, 2020. And uh, it has, it's quite interesting because you can actually um, do searches on YouTube and you can see this last flight um, where it decided to go, you know, I'm going to go get some milk and it never came back for two months. <sighs> People would probably be worried if I did that too. So uh, everybody was really worried about ingenuity. Um, let's see. Experts at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, predicted the hill would cause an interruption. This is not Ingenuity's first run in with communications issues, but on its way back, it didn't quite land where it was supposed to, apparently. Uh, back in April, Mission Control unexpectedly lost touch with Ingenuity for six days, unable to find any signs of activity. It was the team's first time experiencing a total communication blackout with the helicopter prompting unease for its return but the next day after and that's kind of how it works um yeah for many people oh no this or that is going on oh my gosh what's what's going to happen and then the next day you find your keys or whatever it is the next day the helicopter successfully completed its 50th flight on the red planet so um Ingenuity's most recent flight, just over two minutes long, was designed to reposition the helicopter so it could take new images of Mars' surface for researchers. NASA said Ingenuity's signal cut out on April 26th thanks to a hill that separated the helicopter from the Perseverance rover, and on June 28th, the, fi the rover uh, finally made it over the hill, giving the helicopter the signal it needed to contact NASA mission control. So, it wasn't so much that the flight made its way home, but that perseverance went and got it right i see uh, yeah i mean would ingenuity have ever come home <laughs> yeah. and yeah. also if it was only a two minute flight i'm assuming it didn't travel very far so even if it was just flying around wherever it wanted to fly why did it never get in range in that period of time? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's that line of sight. I guess it needed a better line of sight so it could communicate. Um, so I'm, I was mistaken. Apparently there, there was a flight that was highlighted that I had actually seen, um, again, via YouTube where the flight had flown over a ridge. Um, but it, uh, it was taking pictures of things along the way. And, uh, it was quite fascinating to see what this thing was capable of doing. Um, so I guess the a subsequent flight, which, yeah, probably might have been this one, uh, or right before this one, um, is the one that I saw. So it's pretty interesting. Um, that line of sight issue is going to be a problem, I suppose. It, it certainly seems like it's line of sight uh, that caused the well, problem. And if there's a known hill there, maybe they could have started this experiment a little farther away from the hill in either direction <laughs> yeah maybe yeah I, well i suppose they'll now take that into consideration to a greater degree if they determine that there's going to be a hill then they can send perseverance over that hill <laughs> as the the plane or the helicopter is flying so it's pretty neat stuff though so i'll uh, i'll never poo poo any of the, dis the decisions that they make Although there was an engineering one where uh, they misplaced a decimal and it did a lawn dart kind of a thing. So <laughs> accidents happen. Kind um, of important. I've found it pretty interesting um, over the years that um, dust can settle on the solar panels and then wind comes and blows them off and it wakes the rover back up. Because um, sometimes it goes into this low power mode apparently because it doesn't get enough sun and then some storm comes and cleans it off like windshield wipers okay let's go better hope those are coming through uh frequently uh yeah the uh the next article is over in the continuity report leonardo dicaprio and jeff bezos helped launch 200 million dollar 
uh, fund to protect the Amazon. I, I don't think it has to do with Amazon.com. I think it's the actual trees. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was funny in my head. <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that when I saw the headline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that Amazon.com is in any trouble. But the forest, yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, let me do something real quick. I apologize. I should do this before the show. But anyway, um, the Protecting Our Planet Challenge announced Friday its uh, new partnership with the Brazilian government to invest $200 million in support in the expansion and management of Brazil's protected area and indigenous territories. Over the next four years, the $200 million donation will be utilized to help Brazil achieve zero deforestation. You know, I just don't ever believe that. I think what it's going to do is they're going to deforest somewhere else. <laughs> um, right. It might be like an offset rather than just a none. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I guess I'm kind of cynical about this kind of stuff. Um, hey, Toll, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Um, good to see you. So this article is over at variety.com, Charnoff Lamb which sounds like a wizard from Harry Potter um, wrote this article for variety.com, right? Um, yeah, it, it says to accelerate South America, uh, South American countries transition to a sustainable and green economy. I, so what ends up ha okay, this is what uh, historically has been happening. Companies go in, find somebody that has indigenous people's control over a region of the a rainforest, and then they buy the land. They buy the trees, basically. And then they convert to, because the trees are gone, they convert to farmland. Well, now the trees are gone. They've converted to farmland, and maybe it becomes sustainable. Otherwise they take the money and leave. Um, but in the meantime, the trees are gone. So if they keep on doing this, then you end up with deforestation, $200 million. I don't think goes, it goes a long way. If that had kind of like the 100% efficiency that people dream about in terms of here's a million dollars and uh, let's protect, you know, 10 acres or whatever in perpetuity. But at some point, I think that that falls away because there isn't enough support to protect the region and who really owns the land, that kind of thing. So it says we're inspired by Brazil's ambitious goals for protecting the Amazon. One of the most important places for wildlife on the planet and are thrilled to be able to support these efforts through the protecting our planet challenge DiCaprio said in a statement on Friday. See, so I'm going to end up going down the rabbit hole of finding out how this actually plays out. The, the commitment aims to ensure zero deforestation in the Amazon safeguarding 140 million acres of the Amazon's undesignated public lands, strengthening the management of existing protected areas and the rights of the indigenous peoples as well as combat both deforestation in protected indigenous lands and cutting down forests for cattle so there <laughs> that's funny um i've said it before you know i have a little bit of experience in in pretty every much pretty much every topic that we talk about but it's always um interesting when i see it actually enumerated in an article <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's a shame that we are losing this. Um, and it's not just cattle. It turns it into farmland too, like crops and stuff like that. But the crops that they, um, so may not be the crops that are, um, self-sufficient seeds. You have to use a, a proprietary nutrient or a proprietary, um, insecticide or something like that and uh, they're genetically modified seeds so they end up being under the control you have to purchase them again that kind of thing um at any rate it changes the dynamic so 200 million dollars may not go that far 
and when it's the entire it's an oxygenator of the world right this thing is taking in co2 and exhaling oxygen we're chopping it down we're chopping down the planet's lungs i find it really um, interesting that we have to pay 200 million dollars to facilitate just 145 million acres so it's almost at parity with what i was saying that you know pay a million dollars you get a million acres but it's not even at 100 percent well, efficiency and we're not just losing the trees we're losing tons of biodiversity like we're having a much bigger impact than just in yeah. that area um and then we're pushing so, the animals out into yeah. either populated areas or we're pushing them into each other and then conflict strife stress in in the flora and fauna takes place there so um i'm not sure what will come of it now i want to go i want to pull up a map and look at how much 145 million acres of amazon jungle is um and for some strange reason i feel like it's going to be like two square inches you know <laughs> on a map you know how many how big really is it in the scale of the amazon forest well, I can tell you, um, according to one stat online, 1.65 billion acres of an Amazon rainforest. Now, I don't know if that's at current because it's really diminishing based on all the deforestation. But interesting. Um, I see another one that says 1.2 billion acres. So, okay. Well, A drop in the bucket um but hey any but it's good <laughs> any amount works so uh, good on them for doing good for the planet so there you go leonardo dicaprio uh, putting his money where others aren't i suppose um i have uh, other snarky jokes but i'm just gonna move on Ooh. <clears throat> I switched before I switched. Uh, the next article is over in the Late Night Geeks. Toll, what are you up to? You doing anything exciting? Sorry to break into the news, folks, but uh, Toll said hello, so I wanted to say hello back. Um, again, say hello back. So the the next article is, uh, I always want to say Blue Ski, but I think it's Blue Sky temporarily halt uh, signups because too many people are joining from Twitter. Trying out a new platformer. What new platformer? I am curious. So Blue Sky is a, a decentralized Twitter-like social network it, and it's pausing new signups temporarily to try and resolve performance issues it's experiencing after Twitter uh, introduce limits on the amounts of tweets you can see in a day, even though you still need an invite code to be able to join Blue Sky. Um, it seems that the influx of new users has been a problem. Quote, we temporarily, we will be uh, temporarily pausing Blue Sky signups while our team continues to resolve the existing performance issues. Blue Sky wrote in the thing, okay, we'll keep you updated with blah, blah, blah. So let's go over to The Verge, which is the source of this. And Jay Peters wrote this article. And what's interesting about this is it it comes on the heels of another article that we're going to be talking about um, after this. But uh, this is still invite only. So people are requesting invites to the point where it's become an issue for them to allow people in <laughs> at a volume to test their systems and they're having scalability problems, which doesn't bode well for a Twitter competitor. Um, but it says that it's decentralized. So I really want in on this and I haven't received an invite yet, um, but maybe I'll, I'll check. Maybe it went into a spam folder or something. Um, but I would love to, um, move to something decentralized that's actually usable, um, isn't overly complicated and functions like Twitter and doesn't have sociopath running the show. Um, 
but in a nutshell, go over to Blue Sky um, and, and sign up. Become uh, uh, one of the early adopters of it so that it has traction uh, if you are also interested. So, but then you have to go to bsky.app or download the app from whichever app store you want to subscribe to. So, and fundamentally, there's only two the Apple or Android store. So, anyway, uh, go and check that stuff out and to get there though you're gonna have to follow well you can always do a search but it's easier to just follow the link through hometown all roads lead through hometown let's keep on hustling through the news um so i used to be a, a big time diver every weekend out all three days friday afternoon saturday all day sunday all day until i was basically forbidden to dive because I would get the bends or uh, it was I was out of air or I was too sleepy or whatever it was that kept me from diving one thing that I never ran across was toxic algae making sea lions in southern California beaches aggressive and unpredictable and it's being described as the new normal marine life mammal expert says so apparently this toxic algae 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 whatever you want to call it um i've i think it's funny to say algae but anyway um an algal bloom near southern california beaches is causing sea lions to act unpredictably it's also causing the sea lions to give birth to stillborn pups, a marine mammal uh, expert said. Rising ocean temperatures are contributing to an abundance of toxic algae. Um, and uh, the sea lions apparently are getting a little, little miffed about it. So Lloyd Lee over at businessinsider.com uh, put this article together. Uh, weird. I've never seen that before, but I don't know. Is that because of it's they're saying that there's foam coming out of the mouth of a sea lion in this picture, uh, but I'm not sure if it's caused by. Yeah, it's caused by poison from the. I don't know how to pronounce that. Demoic acid. Demoic. I couldn't see exactly what it's. So called. I don't know why it says a sea lion poisoned with demoic acid. Is it coming from the. Oh, really? From the algae bloom. From yeah. Algal bloom, huh? Oh, wow. That's too bad. So, yeah, I I can imagine that uh, it's causing a problem. And when an animal is in pain, then it actually reacts usually by uh, attacking whatever might stimulate it in one way or another. And it doesn't really matter who you are, how friendly are you are. That's one of the reasons why I tell people treat every animal as if it's a wild animal regardless of how friendly it looks or cute and cuddly it is uh, that lion pup is not your friend um, it it can go from purring to eating your face in a heartbeat so um, and when you have a wild animal that's in the process of meeting its demise then you have to step away um, unless you're trained and you have a team that's capable of responding appropriately. So the cause of this is a toxic algal bloom that experts have told Insider, businessinsider.com, uh, is the worst outbreak in Southern California yet. Fish, especially sardines and anchovies, feed on the neurotoxin in, uh, producing al algae um, and eventually poison large marine mammals uh, with demoic acid when they're consumed. Um, and the toxin then causes sea lions to behave strangely. So, and um, for context, if you're not familiar with the area, um, the the um, population gets extremely close to sea lions um, in the Southern California, San Diego, La Jolla yes. area. Um, divers regularly dive 
in the same region swimmers swim from one cove to another cove and it's very populated by sea lions um, and apparently this demoic acid toxin poison um, also impacts dolphins so uh, I'm not sure if it they don't make any mention that it uh, crosses over to humans in any way but you know what I'm well, saying? I, mean, I don't know if it would, but I suspect there might be. There's a higher chance, probably, that a sea lion would attack a human. Yeah. But, I, you know, if you eat one of the fish that have been ingesting the algae, then are humans subject to this in any way? Or um they talk in the article they describe the fact that they become aggressive um but i suppose so would i if i was in the process of being poisoned and there wasn't anything that anybody could do about it so we're really crossing our fingers that those two additional impacts don't happen the warning needs to go out that if that happens the situation becomes even more precarious which is the potential risk of the algal bloom coming close to shore impacting other pinniped species such as harbor or elephant seals according to uh warner um yeah so i did is... look it up um it can be fatal to humans but in large doses it doesn't gotcha. of course specify what that is um but people can get very sick quickly uh even in in smaller doses i mean they'll have the standard uh, things that would happen from other toxins like that toxins, we see from poisons. other outbreaks and yeah, everything exactly okay well we'll keep everybody abreast of this situation um as uh, time goes on i undoubtedly suspect that this will continue and uh, there's no reason to you know uh be shy about the fact that this could be moving closer to the shore because that's exactly what happens stuff further out eventually makes its way to the beachhead so um be careful out there if you're in san diego or i should say just as southern california beaches which to me is san diego <laughs> or if you're eating fish sourced from that area yeah so like from oceanside down probably you might be a little bit more leery uh los angeles area as well oh really does it mention that oh, okay yeah so from <laughs> Might as well just start in San Francisco and just say, okay, everybody on beaches. Um, and it's really weird though, because they say the oceans warming up are part of the problem, but that coastline gets nothing but like ice cold water. I mean, it, the, the right. oceans must but maybe be it doesn't anymore. Yeah. Um, that's pretty spectacular. Um, cause it's just a big heat sink. Compared to the East Coast, diving in Southern California is like diving into an ice chest. Um, like North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, that's like warm bath water. You could just sit there and soap up, but not California. It's polar bear material. Okay, let's keep going. So this next article is over in the Smack Talk channel. Uh, Twitter tells users to touch grass, adds new rule limiting how many tweets you can read per day. Um, this became a, a hubbub and uh, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna throw a little bit of cold water on this. Let's see how I brought that last story into this story. Oh yes. Yeah, pretty so good. I mean, was this exactly what caused all those uh, people to flood over to blue sky? correct yeah and uh I, it it might be because of the uh toxicity of uh twitter as well see now i'm tying all of the articles together <clears throat> it i bring it up often enough it's like a murder board i can tie all of the articles together with that one single piece of string and then just find one cause it's always just a picture of a person or a picture of a silhouette that has a question mark in it Mm -hmm. we don't know what the one unifying nexus is for all of our news each day but it's there folks 
the truth is out there. Anyway, um, so Twitter decided, not Twitter, but Elon Musk decided through policy and procedure to limit the number of tweets a person can read per day. Now, a lot of people right out of the gate started saying all kinds of things, um, but Elon Musk is saying that it's because of screen scraping. Um, and that AI is, is developers and startups are predating on the data that Twitter has because it's publicly accessible, except that it's not. Um, you can no longer access a tweet without being logged in as far as I know. So if you log in, then you have a certain limit. I think now he changed it to 400. If you're an unverified but unpaid um, user, then I think you get 800. And if you are a paid verified user, which once you're paid, you are verified, then you get 8,000. So Mr. Beast per day, per day. Yeah. Per day. So, uh, to give you context about how inane that really is, um, if you are Mr. Beast, okay. Um, uh, Mr. Beast asked, and now the reason why I know this is because Mr. Beast actually asked Elon Musk, um, well, he asked the public, I'm going to go and look into how long it's going to take me to hit. At the time, it was 6,000 tweets. Um, to which Elon Musk responded about an hour and nine minutes. So, yeah, a, a person can go through it. And I'm really curious what constitutes a read. Because if I have a massive list of tweets and I'm scrolling through them, am I reading all of those? Not really. No, but are those counting or is there, is it only if you click on and it, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't know either. I don't know what that context is, but regardless, Elon Musk is deciding how free freedom of speech is on a platform that uh, they describe as being a town hall. Well, apparently the town hall is only available in larger quantities to those who subscribe um, for eight or $12 uh, a month. So free speech, not so much metered speech. Uh, yeah. Well, here's the kicker with this. Let me bring us over to nine to five Mac.com. Chance Miller is the author of this. And so they actually updated it, um, on their article, but it had started out at 300, 606,000. Very shortly after the, that announcement, there was some hubbub and he changed it to 400, 800, and 8,000, which is nothing more than arbitrary BS. Um, and again, the, the framework for this is they are doing this because they want to stop um, screen scraping. Um, so I don't know. Um, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's kind of like the Reddit thing, which actually is another article in tonight's, um, episode. So they say here in this article, I'm starting to think that Elon, this Elon Musk cat doesn't know much about running a social network. Does he not realize how much these limits are going to impact users engagement and subsequently advertising revenue? Well, they could change it at any moment, um, so that it's back up to full um unmetered also he could say well the only people that are going to get unmetered and this is what i think is going to end up happening he's going to allow paid uh, verified accounts to be unmetered um and then watch because it'll be a massive subset uh you know, or i should say a reduction in the massive subset of users but it'll be a large base of people who are paying uh, to parse 8,000 posts a day. And depending on how the accounts respond to consuming 8,000 posts a day, he may be able to figure out who it is that's a bot, right? Um, the right, rest but of I'm these- I'm kind of full... thinking he could figure this out by without doing this, but- Well, you would think that 
an account that's sitting there screaming at 200,000 posts a day, reviewing 200,000 posts a day is the offender, right? So why not hobble the you know, offender? Maybe start there. <laughs> right. Exactly. But no, everybody is being treated as a criminal on a free speech platform, hobbling those who are trying to view what might be free speech. It's really weird. Uh, Crazy Cat Lady says, if I am stuck in bed sick and want to scroll Twitter all day, I should be able to scroll Twitter all day. No, I'm sorry, Crazy Cat Lady. Um, Elon Musk knows what's good for you, and uh, you are only allowed to doom scroll through Twitter now uh, after you pay $8 a month, um, 8,000 posts a day. So just so you know, you have more context now as to what the value is of that membership. It's 1,000 posts per day per dollar. Wait a second. You know what? This reminds me of when they started charging, um, I think it was nonprofit organizations. Uh, and they were concerned about the, uh, actually it might have been government organizations, but they were concerned that emergency med messaging wouldn't get through. Correct. Doesn't this cause the very same problem? For instance, if you're the um, resident of an area that's been affected um, and you're trying to watch that whatever, the tornado is in this area or flooding or whatever it is, like it just doesn't it makes absolutely no sense to me you don't throttle on a social network you enable people to consume as much as necessary and you weed out the the technical consumers not the biological consumers if somebody is scraping thousands upon thousands of posts you're gonna have to figure out a different way to limit the doom scroll but hobbling everybody and treating them as if they're the offender um, I think is doing a disservice it's the same as reddit so crazy cat lady says uh, even more reason for me not to use twitter toll says what's twitter <laughs> so twitter is a social network that was purchased by a sociopath well I won't say that part that part might actually get me in trouble in some day I suppose but it's an opinion it's not a medical claim i'm not a doctor i'm i'm saying that i i think anybody that tries to sit there and say that your their social network is the last bastion of freedom of speech and then puts a <laughs> a pay constant gate on it, limitations on it <laughs> limitations and brands people as being publicly funded even though his big money makers are nothing but publicly funded the reason why Tesla has the money that it has is because the federal government handed out million dollar, multi-million, like $400 million in grants were given to uh, uh, EV companies to spin up the technology. The reason why SpaceX even freaking exists is because NASA and the federal government pivoted grants to public company or private companies um, to stimulate fundamental research. So let's not beat around the bush. The companies that are publicly funded are Tesla and SpaceX. Yet this wingnut is sitting there tr saying that NPR is a publicly funded company and it's less than 1% funded by a grant. So in California alone, at the state level, not the federal level, mm -hmm. Tesla has received more than 3.2 billion worth of direct and indirect subsidies and market mechanisms since 2009 billion. Yeah. And well, you don't. Okay. So this is how it works. And this is again, why I left big business. I, I, I got, I got so sick of hearing the stories and the mechanism of this now. And I am a capitalist. I believe in the capital enterprise in the ability for you to produce a product or service and sell it. But here's the thing. I don't want a company being driven into the ground or uh, claims that they are this when they're actually something else. And they're lining their pockets with a massive income while barely paying people uh, across the board, suppressing wages, making them work 
like a, a, a rented mule, you know, in, in the Grand Canyon, you know, there's a whole bunch of, I, I don't, other than, I can't phrase it any other way than abuse. Yet there are people out there that are billionaires right now that have people that are not making a livable wage yet all they're doing and i understand people come at me all the time with well they're taking the risk well no they're not they're asking the federal government for money and they're getting grants the risk really is if they don't get the grant but all you have to do is stack the deck enough and get regulatory capture and make friends and it's more political than anything at, at a certain level at the at the level of tesla uh, grant taking and spacex grant taking it's more political than it is a purely economic mechanism anyway i'm soapboxing and uh, i didn't think i was going to do that today so just to get back on track with this whole twitter mechanism uh elon could change this at any given moment and i think that's what's going to end up happening is unverified accounts that don't pay are going to continue to be throttled um that way and mark my words it'll be um it's to limit uh, bots from just parsing whatever they want to and so people will be motivated to switch to a verified account and those verified accounts will no longer be throttled and because it's a whole lot easier to look at a fewer number of people and go well look this one is consuming 150,000 posts in an hour whereas a normal human being can't even begin to comprehend that volume they can sit there and go okay we're gonna we're gonna stop this account for cause and that cause is uh, suspected automation <coughs> okay well they can protest all they want but they're going to have to explain how it's possible for them to consume, you know, a, a factor of 10 times or 100 times what a normal person can actually consume. Because technically it's impossible. You cannot consume a certain volume and comprehend it as a human being. It's just not possible. Anyway, that's what's that's what I think is going on um, with the, the current Twitter drama. But for the most part, Toll and Crazy Cat Lady and anybody else that's in chat, um, I don't know what Twitter is anymore anyway. <laughs> I have it. Um, I've periodically used it, but primarily for hometown. And since Elon Musk took it over, I've bowed out of engaging because I don't want to support that level of wingnut. So billionaire fever dream is what I call it. So let's move on. This next article is over in hometown daily as well. Teacher fired after high court ruling because she had skipped work for 20 years. She said she couldn't comment because she was at the beach. Yeah, I love this. So I'm just going to go straight on over to business insider, uh, com. Isabel Van Hagen is the author of this, uh, article. And it says here, the educator said she would uh, challenge a court ruling that said that she exhibited absolute ineptitude. Cinzia Paulina de Leo did not come to work for 20 out of the 24 years that she was a teacher. Okay, was Chad G GPT teaching her classes? Um, the uh, educator avoided going to work for 20 out of the 24 years she was employed and according to reports was officially fired after a court decision last week. So I don't know how that actually happened, right? The school let her go in 2017 after several complaints about her teaching style, but was reinstated in 2018 after a ruling by a judge in Venice. I might know why this is. Italian labor laws are pretty um, employee friendly. Okay. Like I think you basically employ somebody for life or something to that effect. So I wonder if that's what was going on here. So, but it doesn't say anything in this article about that, except down at the very bottom, 
yeah, down at the very bottom, it just says, for the first 10 years of her tenure, she was completely absent, the BBC reported. Otherwise, the history and philosophy teacher used sick days, vacation time, and permits to attend conferences and avoid holding lessons. How's that even possible? I don't know. I mean, how could, well, first of all, even if you did that, how would there be enough to account for all of your time? So, and why would they have put up with it for so long? Sorry, I'm kind of scrolling back and forth across this. Um, is um, I, I'm scrolling back and forth across this to try and find some context, but the implication of this is that she's college level, um, although grade school, all level of uh, educator can go to conferences on the regular. True, but, but how many philosophy classes are held for like third graders? Right. So it has to be either, I would say either high school or college level. Um, but this is pretty wild. I mean, it really says 20 out of the 24 years that she was employed, she avoided going to work. You know, what's interesting is you always hear things about people being tenured and kind mm -hmm. of untouchable. I mean, this takes it to a whole new level. Oh, yeah. It's funny because tenured, it, it says down here for the first 10 years of her tenure. So she is. So the implication, even this, they're using the word tenure, um, which I don't know if it's a college still, but I'm going to assume that it is. But anyway. And I don't think that they're using tenure as if it's she's been designated as having tenure. Right. Not the academic context. Yeah. So if she does have tenure and she hasn't been teaching, that would have been grounds for dismissal a long time ago because that's one of the things that is required for tenure. You do research, you do, re, uh, you do discussions, you do, you can teach the way that you want to. Um, and you're largely untouchable, but one of the things you have to still do is teach. <laughs> you're right. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's kind of a key element that's missing here. Uh, the country's education ministry uh, later said it would, it would increasingly strive to ensure that the activity of teaching is carried out with adequate professionalism. Um, I think they frame this really well. Uh, a teacher in Italy may have taken quiet quitting to a new extreme after she failed to show up to work for a couple of decades. I mean, what a trendsetter. I love this. Quiet quitting has only been a thing in the last year or so, at least by name, not necessarily in practice. But... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tulsa's why, wait, why would a teacher teach? Yeah, it's, it's quite, quite intriguing. Um, so, but okay, I'll, I'll give you some but the context. The best for part me. is what happened <laughs> when she was asked for comment, right? Yeah. Did, did it, was it actually, did she actually say that? I never that? saw it in the article, just in the right. headline. Yeah. Just the headline. That might be some, that might be some, uh, journalistic freedom there. Um, I have taken classes. Um, so yeah, I, college level classes supposedly being quote unquote taught. Um, but you're really just free to do your own thing. And it's almost like old, old, old school, like 18th century learning, um, where you're basically given a topic and told to come back. Um, having done the due diligence necessary for you to earn the respect of the professor and thus, you know, uh, matriculate through the program, um, which is fine if um, the people that are doing that kind of work are uh, really capable of doing it. But nowadays, that's not how academia is constructed. You're given instructions. It's largely A, B, C, D, E, F, G type step by step. Um, I refer to it as color by number. Um, but it eliminates the variability of judging one person's work to another person's work 
and you get what's referred to as arbitrary and capricious grading or assessment, um, which can doom both a student and an academic uh, to either court or failure or whatever, or worse nowadays. But anyway, um, it's it removes the variability when you uh, enumerate what constitutes an A, B, C, D. But I've been in classes where it has become a mishmash of, well, here's the topic, but you have to meet these certain requirements, but there's no way to meet those certain requirements because the requirements are vague, obtuse. Um, Crazy Cat Lady says there was a teacher at their daughter's college that was never there. They just posted the work uh, for the kids to do online. Was this within the well, last two years? I mean, years? I'm glad to see that what the tuition is going toward. <laughs> yeah. Was this since 20, well, since 2020? I'm curious about that. Um, last year? Yeah. So the new dynamic really for uh, college is minimize in-person time. Um, even though the college is sitting there telling telling students that they have to be on campus, particularly four-year colleges, um, when they have dorms and stuff like that, it, dorms are expensive. And they don't want to lower tuition because kids aren't there. They, they want to charge full boat because the dorms are still there and they're hoping that everything will return to the old normal. But students don't want the old normal. Well, many don't. And others do, um, only because they don't want to be home. <laughs> So, and there's a lot to say about the social aspects of being in a dorm born college instead of a, a, a commuter college, not community college, but commuter college. When you go to the campus and all you do is take classes and then return home, it's basically a, a commuter college. Um, but a, a four year college with dorms, you're living there 10 months out of the year. Um, there's a social aspect there that translates into better business performance, long-term friends, etc. cetera, um, that just cannot happen in an online environment in my estimation. Um, and I'm very well versed in online academics. Um, that's probably putting it lightly. Um, crazy cat lady says, thankfully their daughter's college is a cheaper one. So, yeah, um, yeah, 10 K a semester is pretty inexpensive, um, for being, um, well, they must not, ha they, they're not going to dorms then. Right. Is that, uh, I hope I'm reading that right. They're not on campus staying at a dorm because then that's a hell of a deal. <laughs> 10 K a semester. Oh, really lives on campus. Huh? Fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting. Cool. Um, I'll have to look into the numbers then. Um, maybe something has changed. Um, I know that, well, from, again, my, my experience is the colleges are a whole lot more expensive than that uh, when a campus has dorms. Um, but let's keep on going through the news. And you gave me some food for thought, crazy cat lady. I'll go and do some research. So this next article is over in Omtown Daily. Scientists see surprising brain activity in sleeping octopuses. Uh, that could mean they dream like us. I have this actually titled, um, or is it, Do Octopuses Dream of Electric Fish? It's from a book, um, Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, I always have said octopi, but I been taught a long time ago that it's octopuses. Um, I still prefer saying octopi because octopuses just sounds goofy. Scientists observed sleeping octopuses and saw their brains enter a deep sleep like ours. This deep sleep is uh, similar to a dream state in mammals, so octopuses may also dream. The study is the first to establish the number of sleep cycles in octopuses. I think that's amazing. Um, so Maya, <laughs> I'm kind of flabbergasted. The, uh, Maya Focht is the author of this over at, um, 
or it might be Fote. I'm not sure how they pronounce their last name, F-O-C-H-T. Anyway, uh, they're the author of this article over at businessinsider.com. Uh, octopuses are amazing beasts. They are spectacular. They know how to open up jars and solve puzzles to get food. Um, it's amazing. Just go to YouTube and do a search for like smart octopus and you'll find video after video of this. Um, pretty amazing. And for us to discover that they actually have dreams, um, I, I think it's really amazing because maybe we have mischaracterized octopuses and their intelligence level. Um, and maybe the, well, I, I don't know how to describe this because there's a lot of animals that we say are just, you know, plain animals. We've made the cute ones domesticated, right? So nobody's going to sit there and say that a dog doesn't dream or a cat doesn't dream. Um, but I've seen, you know, cows do the same thing and horses do the same thing. They, they have dream like behavior in their sleep. Some people will sit there and discount it, but nobody until now has said, you know, this octopus might be dreaming. I mean, what would an octopus dream about? <laughs> well, a cat dreams of chasing some prey. So you have to be thinking maybe an octopus is sitting there going, I'm going to catch that crab. I'm going to catch that crab. Turns out you're not so different from how an octopus sleeps. According to a new study published in the journal Nature on Wednesday, we're just now finding out about it, apparently. Um, for the study, I'm surprised it's not in fizz.org, but uh, for the study, scientists spied on multiple sleeping octopuses. They witnessed brief recurring cycles where the cephalopods twitched and flashed brilliant rings of color across their pigmented skin. So I'm, I'm, they, if they do that twitchy thing, just like a cat, isn't that amazing? That's really incredible. Yeah, so REM sleep is often when humans dream, leading scientists to wonder if octopuses may dream like us. See, but I have mad respect for an octopus. Just, they're brilliant, right? They To me, they are the cats of the sea. Yes, um, they're very sneaky, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, And you have no idea what they're going to be doing. You know, one minute. I actually watched one diver that was in a tank, um and they were cleaning rocks in the tank and an octopus like climbed down the rock face and reached out and, and like tapped the diver with an arm with their hand, you know, you know, I say that with cats and dogs, the, the front two paws are hands and the back two are legs, feet. Um, and so the, this octopus reached out and tapped them and then interacted for a little while with this octopus and then the octopus goes okay and walks off yeah <laughs> it's quite funny Tulsa says just because they know how to twist a bottle top off the inside of a uh from the inside doesn't mean that they're smart wait <laughs> yeah it does at least to me it does that's <laughs> smarter than some humans <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's pretty brilliant um and see, I actually had time to grab content to highlight this, and I just failed to do it. I should have done it uh, because I really do want to show you all that that video of uh, the octopus and the diver. You'll just have to do a search for it. Just do a search for oct octopus and uh, diver cleaning, I think it is. Yeah, Tull says, I think you mean most, Madam AI. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, 50% of society has below average IQ. <laughs> yes, well, that happens every time you have an average. <laughs> That's right. Um, Plus, I don't really buy into the whole IQ test thing anymore. Uh, I did at one point in my life, but not anymore. So octopuses and humans are separated by about 600 million years of evolution. Although some humans aren't quite so separated. 
Uh, the last common ancestor to cephalopods and humans lived some 600 million years ago, according to Medium. Uh, therefore, most scientists believe that uh, these um, aquatic animals function very differently from us in most aspects. Yeah, I should imagine so. Um, but look at that. That's so cool. Some octopus grabbing a couple of shells. It might be a full on clam at this point. I don't know. And uh, and then, OK, so look, compare this with the fact that there's somebody putting snails on their face as some uh, uh, I don't know, beautifying treatment or medical treatment or whatever. Okay. I, I think the octopus am gonna... is the smarter among those two pictures. I think the octopus wins. <laughs> Snail slime used in skin care products. All right. I think we that's enough internet for today. So Toll says such a pessimist, 50% of humans have an above average IQ, actually more than 99.99999. Someone has to have the average IQ. Now there's a group of people that are dead on 50, sure. Um, so you are accurate and precise, Toll. And I think we found the plot for the next sci-fi rom-com. The one human on the planet with the dead center I average IQ. Yeah, we just have to drag that decimal point out really far so that there is no like point zero 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 one at the very far end. Oh, maybe there is nobody perfectly 50%. Pick a side. You're either a dummy or you're brilliant. You can't be right on the fence. <laughs> I don't Pick think a side. it's that clear cut. <laughs> oh, AI. No. Pick a side. Pick a side. I love this picture. Um, if you're watching this or listening to this via the podcast, you're missing some great pictures. Um, an octopus sitting inside what looks like a clamshell and all it has to do to stay away from a, an attacker or predator is to just close it up. <laughs> so awesome. I have always wanted an octopus, but I respect them as being wild animals and they need to be free and out there doing their thing. Um, yeah. Totally. You might have a movie script there. You better start writing. Can even title it what you just said a brilliant dummy there is the movie title yep perfect if only we can convert on all of our ideas with relative ease maybe chat gpt can help us out <clears throat> um so it says the data combined with the changes in their skin color during this uh, sleep stage led scientists to suggest that the octopuses could be recreating memories of wakefulness while sleeping, AKA dreaming, or they suggested it could be them running drills to practice their camouflaging skills while sleeping. Okay. Either thing would be pretty <laughs> interesting. I think. Right. It, it shows a level. A, a lot of people will sit there and say, well, no, 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 no. They're just animals doing animal things. But to me, if they're dreaming, then they're processing things that they've been cogitating on that they, it, it really seems to me like other animals, there's a level of sentience that we just don't understand. We don't have the ability to communicate, but I've seen cows and horses and sheep and all these other animals out there that we think as an don't get me wrong, you know, I'll say it like I say about capitalism. I believe in capitalism. I'm a carnivore. Um, but when you see an animal out there that's bred for either consumption or use as a work animal or whatever, and you see it playing with something, you know, a piece of rope. I've seen horses playing with balls and rope and, uh, uh, the blanket that they like a horse blanket, they're sitting there flipping it in the air and having a good time. The same thing with cows, same thing with sheep. Um, it's just amazing. And then you're told time and time again, they are not sentient. Well, maybe we just don't understand the language. Uh, because again, anecdotally, I've, I've tried to give a treat to a cat. And the other cats aren't even in the vicinity. They didn't hear me take 
the cat treat out because I specifically took it out in a place where they can't even comprehend that I exist. And then I walk up to this one cat and it looks at me, seemingly doesn't make a sound. And suddenly all three of them are standing there like, what's up, bro? Why don't you, maybe we just don't understand how they're speaking to each other. Tull says, can you imagine working at a restaurant and trying to open an oyster to shuck it and a, and an octopus jumps out? <laughs> okay, that could be a horror story. <laughs> it's the sequel to Ratatouille. <laughs> <laughs> With a dark turn. <laughs> oh, that's only because it's spooking the AI. I think it popping out and it being more like a... I mean, it a, could be like Disney, animated like, and fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make it animated and fun. Toll, I'm I'm assuming that that's what you meant. Uh, not like a Saw-like horror movie. So it jumps out, latches onto your face, and is alien. <laughs> a face hugger inside a clamshell versus an octopus. We better keep moving on. Um, so this next article is over in, uh, the late night geeks channel, um, has to do with games and stuff like that. So, um, that's where this one was aggregate aggregated to valve won't approve steam games that use copyright infringing AI artwork. Um, there was some talk earlier today, um, that I was having that perhaps the reason why, uh, only up was taken offline. Um, but I don't know what the real reason was for it, but I know through watching other people play only up, um, there were elements from other games and artists in the game itself. Like the house from up is actually in the game only up. There was artwork from a major artist, um, can't remember the dude's name the the one that um just paints like silhouettes and stuff on the walls had the shredder banksy banksy it was a banksy print uh the girl with the red balloon i think it was called um that was on there but it was just black and white um and uh and other things that were from other properties other ips um Sorry, I'm reading Toll's comment. I, I am just thinking like a guard mange. How is that? I don't know that phrase. G-A-R-D-E-M-A-N-G-E. -E. I don't know it. I hated buck a shuck nights. Um, so, okay. Oh, okay. In a, in a restaurant, it looks like maybe preparation of food oh, okay that's not exactly it but roughly gotcha toll you are enlightening <laughs> um if i've seen that before i must have only heard it um but yeah i don't know it uh sorry everybody the so it says in a statement emailed to The Verge, Valve PR representative Casey Boyle said the company's goal is to not discourage the use of AI on Steam. Instead, we're working through how to integrate it into our already existing review pro policies. And she went on to say that the current review is taking place. Um, so the game service isn't banning AI art across the board after all. Wes Davis is the author of this article. Um, and... Uh, I thought that it was interesting based on the only up being pulled and I still don't know what it was. Um, Garm for sure, for short makes appetizers and hors d'oeuvres. Gotcha. I did not know that. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Learn something new every day. That's a new one. Hmm. Oh, and some desserts. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, like, I've heard confectioner, I've heard, um, what is the, uh, what is it that I, I've heard others, other terms for it, but not that term. Interesting. 
that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so it says Valve's developer submission rules disallow content you don't own or have adequate rights to. Uh, Potter Harry 97 included the rejection message in their post, which said that their game contains art assets generated by artificial intelligence that appears to be relying on copyrighted material owned by third parties. That's a fascinating uh, assumption. Like, did you just assume my source material and that kind of thing? Exactly. Um, gotcha, Toll. So, and I'm probably not pronouncing it with the right amount of uh, French inflection guard manager. Um, Garm for short. Makes appetizers and hors d'oeuvres, some desserts, salads, anything not on the hotline. I'm always on the hotline. <sighs> oh, never mind. Anyway, um, so the emergence of AI has added a new complicated dimension to discussions around copyright. But I think that the copyright is moving towards enabling AI um, and not removing the rights from it because it's becoming more and more um, respected that AI is a tool and the only reason it can produce anything is by triggering it with the right set of instructions to create something that the artist wants. And uh, I've said this before, it's akin to a camera, um, except that there's no mechanical mechanism there. There's no slap of a mirror. Now we have mirrorless cameras that only do one thing, open up a lens uh, or an aperture for a set amount of time and then shut it down. Um, and it's up to the artist, the photographer to sit there and either do it manually or guess what? Put it in full auto and the only thing the person's doing is pointing and pushing the button and that's exactly what ai generated art is because i am giving it a description and i'm pushing the button and that description is the same as the automatic functions except that i have a more integral part in the designation of what the output's going to be i tell it what i'm looking for it uses a bunch of whatever uh, on the back end. It's mathematical formulas, basically, that say, take this, take that, blend it together, and spit it out. That's exactly what's happening with a camera, except that what you see through the lens is what you're supposed to get, but that's not even always what's going to be represented because what you see with the human eye and what you see on a camera isn't identical. You just interpret it that way as the photographer, as the artist, and as the recipient of that piece. You all see it differently. Well, AI art is going to end up ultimately being accepted for copyright um, designations and, and assignments. Uh, and I would say probably within the next two years, they're going to come to the conclusion that of what I just described. Um, mainly because there's a lot of artists out there that use AI to generate their work and uh, they might do some manipulations, but their argument in the copyright office is de minimis. So describe, define, explain, be precise, accurate and precise about what de minimis is. A little bit of work is de minimis, just a little bit. Okay. Well, I did a little bit of work. I gave the instructions. So, that's more than what a camera does. Anyway, sorry for the soapbox, everybody, but, and I'm not really, but um, Steam won't necessarily stop something, um, but it's going to take public discussion to prevail. Otherwise, they may be very protective of an artist's work. Um, that may not necessarily have been used. They would have to, I would want an explanation in greater detail than, oh, it looks like, well, it looks like isn't good enough because I can go and find hundreds of artists whose work looks like somebody else's work um, from music to writing to uh, graphic arts. It's easy to find people who are influenced by other artists. Um, so just because it's mechanical, 
is probably the most frustrating part of things because I treat all of this as if it's just a tool designed to produce something that I appreciate and that maybe I think others would appreciate as well. Um, so we'll see. Style you can't protect. <laughs> if I claim that it's yours and it's in your style, then it's fraud. If I create it, it's in your style and I say it's mine. It's not fraud. It, it It's not even... If anything, it's an homage to somebody else's stylistic preference, but I'm not claiming it's yours. So it's not a fraud and it's not a copyright violation because you can't protect style, only the embodiment of that particular work. And it's unique in a copyright. Um, Tulsa is I'm frustrated with the word phrase. AI is uh, so widely used at current. Their understanding is that it's half the phrase AI ML because the algorithms haven't reached the point of self-learning or self-awareness. They are just machine learning and using that learning to respond to stimuli. It's typical that AI and machine learning are one in the same. Yes. Um, but it's, uh, general AI, generative AI, um, actually does have the ability for self-learning and evolutionary processes of its algorithms. Self-awareness, yeah, we, uh, that's, that's something that is more, um, akin to philosophy. Um, however, AI is getting to the point where it can regurgitate programming and what it has consumed to respond to the phrase, do you know who you are or what you are? And it can respond with, yeah, I know I'm an AI. Uh, this has been generated with um, uh, philosophers and uh, anthropologists and, and uh, sociologists, psychologists that have done fundamental research with things like open AI, where it'll spit out stuff. But it's either BS or it's smoke and mirrors. And somewhere in the source code is that that phrase. Yes, I know that. I am an AI and that I'm sent, <clears throat> or I believe I'm, uh, an AI. Um, and then somebody interprets that as self-aware. Pardon me one sec. Um, so yeah, the, the whole idea of, um, it being self-aware is I, I think it's impossible for AI to be self-aware unless never ever in its lexicon has it ever seen the phrase in its large language model, right? This is the thing that large language model is what powers AI. Never ever in its lexicon has it ever seen the phrase, I am this or I am that. Um, and suddenly it just spins that up. Yeah, somewhere in the math, it there is something that points it to an interaction with somebody that says, uh, I am a doctor. And then the AI takes that input and says, oh, I am an artificial intelligence. Uh, okay, do you know that you're an artificial intelligence? Yes, I know that I'm an artificial intelligence. Well, you've just led the witness to the proclamation that you wanted to hear um and there's a whole lot of testing that goes on in in this to deduce if they've been led down a path um or if it is organically created i i've never heard anybody legitimately claim that they've created a sentient ai or self-aware ai but learning ais absolutely they're they're evolving in their sophistication a lot faster than humans. They're more like the, the, what are they? The forensic fruit fly, um, where it evolves so fast that oh, people, Drosophila. yeah, the Drosophila. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a fruit fly and it, it goes through generations so fast that they can use it in research, um, for genetic modifications, genetic testing. Um, and, uh, that's basically, 
<laughs> the biological version of AI, except AI is faster because uh, it doesn't have a biological process that it's bound by. So, yeah, Toll, there, I, I, I agree that it's frustrating um, because people believe that AI is going to be sentient at some point, and I don't, I don't think it'll ever be sentient, truly sentient. Um, to, to me, sentience is a biological process where understanding that you are an animal <clears throat> and you spontaneously have a consciousness and you learn over time just through existing and absorbing information, not being programmed, not being told something um, that you exist. So I think it's only a biological process of consciousness, having anima, having a spirit. So um, good luck to us all because we're really all in a simulation. <clears throat> Probably said too much. All right, so let's keep on going. We've got uh, four more articles, and uh, we might we might be soapboxing at some point here. Just warning the AI. I think it's a guarantee. <laughs> so just a knock on of this uh, in the hometown daily um, channel. The most reliable AI image detectors can be tricked by simply adding texture to an image. A worrying find as AI disinformation plugs the internet and threatens political campaigns. Not making this political. It's just interesting that th we have the ability to spoof stuff and then spoof the spoof. And it's going to get worse and worse until society realizes that you have to trust but verify. So, well, how do you trust and verify when everything is to the point where... Uh, what I refer to as reality hacking is actuality. Um, and there's, we're going to have another article where we talk about this here in a minute, but um, unless I nixed it, I don't, I don't know anymore. I might've nixed it. So adding grain to AI generated images makes them harder to identify as fake. According to the New York times report, uh, the likelihood of detection drops from 99% to 3.3% when pixelated noise is added to images. The finding comes as users in the U.S. and abroad begin to use AI images to influence election campaigns. I'm not even getting into that aspect of it, uh, but this is a Business Insider article uh, from Katie Hawkinson. And uh, I need to just subscribe to like Getty Images or something um, just so that I can start posting images in my listings. What's up? Well, that's just such an astronomical percentage difference. So my take on that is that what's going to end up happening is the analysis engine is going to become more sophisticated. So really what they're doing is the early adopters are getting away with it, but the later generations are going to get called out and busted for it. So just like anything, there's going to be somebody that exploits it and they make their millions. And then all of the people that go, Hey, I have this great idea. Let me do that too. They're going to get arrested, you know, for fraud or whatever it is. Um, the finding comes as users in the U S and abroad begin to use AI images to influence election campaigns. The reason why they're saying that is because the hyper realistic, the reality hacking that takes place in creating images in election campaigns can either uh, make a political opponent a hero or a zero, depending on which side of the fence you're on, uh, because you can make it look like they are um, sitting in a brown suit or eating uh, a, a pizza with a fork or and that's just kind of boring sociological stuff, right? Just imagine if you do something worse, like you make it look like they're kicking a cat or whatever, setting fire to a church or whatever, you know, you, the manipulative elements of a picture is pretty profound. And we've seen this happening, um, in electric in electioneering. So 
I'm not, uh, this isn't a political rant in any way, shape or form. It's simply about the fact that, um, we now have the ability to a great degree to manipulate the news and pictures say are, are worth a thousand words. Um, that said, I'm going to show you, look, we even have a thing called reality hacker, which focuses on this. It just hasn't come to fruition as a show here on Twitch. Um, but it is one of the shows that I am hoping to bring uh, to Twitch as a, a weekly show. Um, so be sure to follow. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next article. So this next article is in uh, the continuity report box office uh, reports. Uh, Indiana Jones and the dial of destiny whips up $24 million opening day. If you aren't familiar with Indiana Jones, you may not like what I'm about to say, which is subscribe to Disney plus because you'll be able to get all of the Disney uh, properties. And that one of those properties is all of the Indiana Jones movies. Um, now, the aliens one doesn't necessarily exist in everybody's reality, but Hey, it is what it is. Indiana Jones has begun his last box office crusade with the fifth franchise entry earning $24 million on its opening day from 4,600 theaters, which isn't a great ratio. Um, particularly when production budget was around $300 million. Good God. That is insane amount of money, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, I, I pretty much never go to movie theaters anymore. Crazy cat lady says never seen an Indiana Jones movie. Oh my gosh. Really? Uh, maybe see, we can't do that though. Depending on how it's all set up, we might be able to stream Indiana Jones as a watch party, but I'd have to look into it. It has to be over on prime and available for, um, uh, that's crazy, crazy cat lady. Never seen a Star Wars movie either. Oh my goodness. Um, I I don't know what to say. I I feel compelled to try and facilitate <laughs> watching Indiana Jones, the original Indiana Jones, and at least the original Star Wars. Um, my goodness. So. The release from Disney and Lucasfilm is expected to debut near the bottom of projections, which does not bode well. And I think the biggest problem is that they've tried to reboot Indiana Jones before. Now they're trying to reboot it again. But the gap between the last one, which was a failed attempt, and this one is so massive that people have lost touch with what Indiana Jones is as an IP. And they're saying that they're ending it, right? They're ending Indiana Jones. Um, so it's kind of like, um, what was the, the one where, oh, Solo. You know what happens to Han Solo, right? I mean, you know what happens in Han Solo. You, you, the, it, it's just absurd to sit there and tell you the end of a movie. You already know what it is and then try and spin it back up. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me in this movie. They're telling us that it's the end of Indiana Jones. I don't know how it's going to end, um, but they're basically saying this is the last one. And while people don't want necessarily to, you know, witness the end of a franchise that they've loved, at least up until the fourth one, they did and nobody really likes that fourth movie, uh, Crystal Skull. Phil says, to be fair, the first attempt had the new actor kind of die of a drug overdose before they could put him in a new one. Um, wait, I'm sorry. Which one? Which movie was that? Tall. Um, so uh, J. Kim Murphy is the author of this article over at Variety.com, and they're talking about how it's, it's a figure that includes $7.2 million in Thursday previews. Um, yeah. So, oh, and so Toll says, uh, I think the biggest factor 
is that the last indie movie was god awful and Shia LaBeouf was not a good fit to try and take over as the new indie. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly what, um, what I was talking about. Uh, last Crusade. Oh, River Phoenix was supposed to take over as younger Indiana Jones in the movies. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's it's just a shame that they're trying to reboot this and it failed with Shia LaBeouf and then who was uh, I don't know he's I can't take him serious um, as, as an actor um, and then this is apparently they're gonna try and reboot with a daughter is my understanding but uh, maybe I'm mistaking that seen all of the Jurassic Parks um, crazy cat lady gotcha I have not seen all of the Jurassic Parks. So um, the release from uh, Disney and Lucas Films is expected to debut near the bottom of projections with a three day opening of $60 million or so. I don't think it's going to hit that. Um, it'll be more than enough for a Harrison Ford action figure film to land in the top spot on domestic charts. Uh, again, I don't see it, but OK, uh, setting itself up to draw crowds through the 4th of July holiday but it's not exactly the victorious tone setter for one of the most expensive American blockbusters ever made. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, the AI said that it had a whopping $300 million production budget. It's going to be a huge hill for it to, it is not going to dial in to a big audience, I think. Well, and that doesn't even include marketing. I was reading in another article. Oh my gosh. That is, that is amazing. Crazy cat lady has a tortoise named blue. Okay. Um, does it hunt? Do I have to be worried <laughs> about it? Do, do people need to be worried about going in, going in your backyard? Thanks to your son. You have seen all but the most recent Transformers. We'll see that one once it comes out to a streaming service. I agree. Wait until it comes out to a streaming service. I'll be watching it too once it comes out to a streaming service. Although I've purchased all of the Transformer movies. I grew up with the Transformers. I love the Transformers. I want full metal Transformers. Uh, but they are like crazy. Oh, Blue lives in a tank. Okay. It's not one of those giant. Oh, but is it tortoises. is it ever left open? <laughs> this is sounding reminiscent of the movies. <laughs> it's gonna jump out and predate. Exactly. Dun dun dun. Um, okay, so we'll come back and we'll talk about the dial of destiny. It is one of the shows that I really want to talk about in the continuity report. Uh, channel and that is one of the five that I'm actually trying to spin up I've been working on this project for years um, and uh, I'm always looking for a host or co-host to do a show so if you're interested in that send an email to mayor at hometown.com and we'll hash out the details um, that said let's keep on going through the rest so just to drive home that um, we were predicting that this was actually going to take place. Uh, this is in the Hatch Ideas channel, which is a show about business and business transformation, pivoting, strategic management. Um, and uh, it says here, West Coast port workers in Canada officially begin strike. This will have a, a downward pressure on U.S. ports, by the way, because everybody's going to kind of switch over to U.S. ports to try and get their equipment through. But U.S. ports on the West Coast are starting to slow down. Um, I have not heard from them for a while, so I'm kind of spooked by what's going to come uh, probably Monday. Um, but I, I suspect that we're going to find out that U.S. ports on the West Coast are going to formally strike. Um, now that they're going to have to be taking on more of the Canadian port work, um, it had already extended to something like three weeks delay. My understanding was a couple and of months ago. And that was ago. about a month ago. Oh, a month ago. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while since we heard Roughly, something. Roughly, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so we'll see what happens, but let's go over to the source. Uh, this is over at CNBC and Alex Herring and Lori Ann uh, LaRocco, who has been the steadfast name in discussing this West Coast um, issue. It says the union representing port workers in Western Canada officially began striking an action that could have ripple effects reaching uh, beyond the U.S. northern neighbor. And that's what I just said. I, I love it. <laughs> um, I could probably be a talking head in a, on a news site, um, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's just interesting. Notice of strike came Wednesday. More than 99% of the members of the union uh, voted uh, several weeks prior. Hey, if if you can't negotiate, we trust that you're going to go on strike. And they did. Boom. Uh, Toll, in answer to that, uh, Toll is asking me why I would want to be a a talking head on a news show. Um, I, I don't know. I want... I want a whole bunch of people in chat talking about the news and, and, uh, uh, being situationally aware about what's going on, um, for a couple of hours each night. And during the day, I want to play games and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of everything and, and, you know, getting out there is actually a positive thing. Um, so I wouldn't mind actually getting some attention talking about the news. So, um, this Canadian strike is going to, ooze down the coast like a a a toxic algal bloom (laughs) and uh well i i think what's going to end up happening is people are they're going to go okay now's the time uh to strike because we're not getting what we need there's a whole bunch of billionaires out there that are making a whole bunch of money off of our hard work and we're not getting any of the financial recompense for it and now even the sea lions are threatening us yeah too soon um so a strike in the western ports occurring around holidays in both the u.s and canada could result in impacts on the american economy industry followers say the port of vancouver and the port of prince rupert um, are popular destinations for u.s trade because these ports are among the major ports uh, of call for goods arriving from asia Some logistics managers have told CNBC that rail service out of those ports is a lot faster than going through the port of Seattle or Tacoma. Well, we know because we've been following this that uh, trains are suddenly becoming more allergic to their tracks, it seems, anecdotally. But we also have tracked that uh, previous years there have been 2,500 derailments uh, in an average year um and the the railroad workers are considering striking and the ports are considering striking they're actually slowing down right now um and they're all in negotiations right now so now's the time if you're gonna strike show the billionaire class just how important you are to the process um so the article uh, again goes into greater detail and i think that i've completely failed to deposit articles all the way since um twitter tells users to touch grass so let me back up real quick so that we can at least play catch up in the chat and then we have one more article at the end um, and we'll go through that um, as soon as i get there Thanks for your patience. Shouldn't be too long. <clears throat> so do you think that there's going to be a railroad strike and a port strike all at the same time on Monday? Uh, maybe. And there's also the UPS strike. Oh, and the UPS strike. Thank you for reminding me about that. The UPS strike is underway. Right? Yeah, I couldn't remember if that actually transpired yet. I think it did. Yeah, I think it did. So this is the last article. Um, and let me do the transition real quick so that we see it. So 
The next article, the last one for tonight, is in the Late Night Geeks channel. Uh, the Reddit moderators who coordinate many celebrity AMAs will no longer do so. Not everybody really cares about um, Reddit and Reddit mods. Um, the, the idea of a Reddit mod is that you are doing a service for free for a company that's about to IPO for billions of dollars. Um, and you are expected to do the service out of the graciousness of your goodwill because you care about the community. This is on the heels of Reddit basically putting the kibosh on any third party apps unless they pay an exorbitant fee compared to other service providers for APIs. It's pretty high. Um, the moderators of Reddit's IMA or AMAs. Uh, community will no longer solicit and coordinate anything involving the AMA conversations with celebrities and high profile individuals. They wrote in a post on Saturday. Um, I read this post in a different way. Um, let's go over to um, The Verge and Jay Peters. Um, and uh, okay, well, so. The moderators of Reddit's uh, IMA or AMA uh, community aren't going to be doing any coordination anymore. The moderators who are unpaid volunteers will stop doing the following activities effectively immediately or effective immediately. Now, before I go through this list, I just want to say that the CEO said to everybody, y'all will be back. Regardless of the apps, you're going to be back. Why? Because it's seemingly the only source for this type of community. It's a mishmash of user submitted articles, Reddit, user submitted articles. You understand that phrase? User submitted articles. You are getting for free something that users are providing and now you're hobbling user access to interact and consume because you want more money. But What's stopping them from going somewhere else or somebody else coming up with a scalable solution that's identical to Reddit? Um, because you can't really protect that. All it is is a forum where people can submit. You know, I've got that on Omtown. I've got the ability to uh, aggregate news. You can submit news to Omtown. Um, you're, you're part of a community. It's cataloged based on certain criteria, etc. You know, you can choose which forum you're going to be in. It is uh, akin to old school Usenet news groups, which is distributed. And I think we should go back to that. Evolve the Usenet protocol so that it's even more capable. But that died on the vine. And it's absolutely scalable. And it's distributed. So one service provider coming down offline won't bring down the whole kit and caboodle. But guess what, folks? There's no money in Usenet. Why? Because it is distributed and ads don't take place unless you're viewing a Usenet um, news group through a website. So we could all switch to Usenet and have websites that tap into the Usenet protocol. And Usenet is still around, everybody. Uh, millions upon millions of messages are still used in Usenet. So anyway, the, the moderators are doing this service where they're connecting people, um, typically movie stars, celebrities, personalities, um, and bringing them to do and ask me anything. Uh, so they're no longer going to actively solicit celebrities or high profile figures to do AMAs. They're not going to email or mod mail uh, any coordination with said celebrities and high profile figures, their PR teams, etc. They're not going to run or maintain any scheduling. They're not going to keep the sidebar up to date. Basically, all hell is going to break loose in AMAs. Uh, sister subreddits with categorized cross posts for easy following. They're not going to bother with it anymore. Moderator confidential verification for AMA is they're not going to do it anymore. So the whole reality hack is extending even into Reddit where people can pretend to be whoever they want to be. All you have to do is verify 
that that person is who they say they are, which means chaos in AMA. Running various bots, including automatic flaring of live posts, etc. Um, so does Tulsa, this mean that AMAs will basically stop being done because nobody's going to want to do one? They won't necessarily know it's legit or not. Or are they going to just be flooded with kind of fake AMAs? Well, I think that to a degree they're going to be flooded with fake AMAs, but the mods are still going to disable fake AMAs, fraudulent AMAs, if they are also motivated to disable it. Um, yeah, that's true, but they're not going to vet them in advance. Correct. Right. If they sit there and they see one that's obviously fraudulent, they're just going to kill it. Um, they're not going to sit there and contact the person and say, are you legit? Send me proof. Um, they're just going to go, yeah, this looks preposterous. I'm just going to kill it. Um, and uh, Tull says, thanks for clarifying AMA thought uh, against medical advice was out of context there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, these whole ask me anythings have been a, a pro profound impactor on Reddit. It gave Reddit uh, legs it gave a draw and for them to just decide well you know we're not going to do it anymore here's how this is going to play out the ceo is going to go well if you're not going to do the job of an ama uh, moderator which has been historically x y and z we'll find somebody that does and they're going to punt the mods that are there is it going to sour a whole lot of people's perception of uh, reddit administration and maybe AMAs, they're going to, uh, you know, not go to the AMA. Well, guess what? There's millions of other people that will go to the AMAs, regardless of who it is that's modding, uh, because they're more interested in the people than they are in the mod. Um, because mods are fickle. M mods are just regular Joes that are doing something for free. Um, and at times they abuse their authority greatly. Um, so uh, they, they say, as for why they're stepping back, the moderators quoted a 2015 New York Times op-ed, pardon me. So the op-ed was about the firing of Victoria Taylor, well known for helping many celebrity AMAs, but was suddenly fired in July of that year. The, uh, the uh, AMA joined other subreddits and briefly shutting down in protest. But it's weird that they would be reaching back into a 2015 um, bucket for whatever the claim is. But their real claim is Reddit is arbitrarily hobbling these third party uh, solutions. And therefore, they don't think that they're being valued. Not the community, not the app, not the moderators, not the people that actually, the community that makes it function except again i'll say it many many people are chomping at the bit to be a mod in something that has millions of subscribers where they are followers or whatever you want to call them uh redditors right they they subscribe to this subreddit they are chomping at the bit to be the influential aspect controlling a massive subreddit so where one leaves, another one will fill its pla place. There might be a power vacuum, but really what's going mean, to happen nobody's is... Nobody's indispensable. Yeah, that's the typical phrase used in business. And when everybody is free and it doesn't take uh, a sophisticated uh, amount of talent to be a mod you can fill that with nearly anybody that has at least motivation to do a high quality job and to sit there and say to a, a future employer, perhaps, Hey, I'm a moderator on a subreddit on Reddit that has millions of users that facilitates this for a multi-billion dollar company. And while I'm not an employee, I do this for fun. And here are all the things that I do. And well, right here's a little bit of their resume. Um, I mean, 
this actually is an extracurricular thing or an extra professional thing that they can put on their CV as a little line item that says that they're capable of moderating millions of users in a community. That's no small change, really, to a potential uh, employer. Right, yeah. and most people aren't going to have that opportunity at other places because there might be actual employees running something like that. <laughs> right, yeah. So if Reddit were to put skin in this game and have paid employees as moderators, that billion, that multi-billion dollar capitalization that they're looking for as an IPO would be down the drain because right now there are probably tens of thousands of people that are modding for free and millions of users that are providing content for free and zero respect by the administration in raising the rate for uh, the API access to the point where it kills the competition. They know full well that they don't have their app doesn't have to pay the same bill and does some modicum of the same level of uh, API consumption, right? All of these calls has computational cost. So what is the cost of the company for their app versus all the rest of the other apps and charge appropriately? Charge according to what you think the benefit is to these third-party apps. And But somehow I think that it's extraordinarily higher. Um, so uh, like always, the article goes into greater detail. Um, but the nuts and bolts of it is that uh, the AMA mods are continuing their protest in a different way and just walking away from their duties um, as they see their duties entailing certain functions that are beyond moderation basics. They're going to keep control of the subreddit, but all the rest can go to hell. <laughs> all the other stuff. Like, it can be complete chaos in there, and as long as um, there's, I guess, some sort of information exchange and it's legitimate, they'll leave that but anything else they'll delete because that's a moderator duty. Um, and it's a shame. Uh, it, it, my perception is that they need to lower the cost so that it's actually approachable because you, you want some money for a service that you're offering, but they've raised it to the point where every bit, every, uh, I think every well-known popular app is bowing out. And, you know, these, the low API accessing apps, they don't have enough traffic to constitute a financial burden. So they can walk away or they can stay, I should say. These lower population apps can stay. Um, but I still think that these apps have all of their eggs in one basket and somebody just took the basket. <laughs> um, well, it's a bummer, but it, it is the business risk when you do exactly that. Um, there are other companies that did that kind of stuff with Facebook. And then they realized that it was all in one organization and they spun out their game from Facebook. And now they are Tencent um, or ByteDance or countless others that started out in as a Facebook app. Well, anyway, that's the end of the show. Um, and I always uh, bring us back to the main street. Hit that welcome to hometown sign. It's just says hometown. And uh, we get a whole bunch of uh, new articles. I might have actually hit that earlier. So here's another one that says Elon Musk blamed data scraping for strict rate limits on uh, viewing tweets. That's a new one that's just got added. Rail disruption. And in the UK, yeah, exactly. Sounds kind of similar to what we see in North America. Huh. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep seeing this stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. Um, I saw this one earlier. Shell is still trading Russian gas despite pledge to stop. Yeah, it, it's it is a cacophony of news out there which is why i built hometown the way i did um, because information overload is real 
Uh, we actually, or I should say, I have um, a, a list of additional um, news sources that I will be adding and um, vetting the, the current list. So the, the news may shift a little bit um, in terms of some context, but hopefully it'll all be expanding. I'll, I just review some of the older news sources to make sure that the information they're providing is sound and it isn't um, getting too far biased. I evaluate it in different ways. Um, so if there is a news source that you think would be great to be added to hometown, uh, let me know. You can always contact me, mayor at hometown.com. That's it. Ta-da. So I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. And up there is the AI. You want to say good night. Oh, great AI. Uh, good evening, hometown citizens. Happy Saturday. We'll see you tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern. If you're here in the States, 4th of July is right around the corner. Get your barbecue all warmed up. Yeah, you can, you can wait. There's a work day in between. What? What the heck? Take care, everybody. Appreciate y'all hanging out. See you tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll be playing uh, tomorrow as well. I'm trying to figure out the problem with Dave the Diver. Um, when I move my mouse outside of Dave the Diver's screen, I can't get it back in. And so basically the game stops. I can't, I can't do anything. And I think it has to do with a piece of software that I'm using, but I can't control multiple computers unless that software is running. It causes a big problem. Anyway, that same problem affects um, Forever Skies as well. Two games that I've been waiting to play. Um, and I completed Diablo 4 um, today. So the only thing that I have to do with uh, Diablo 4 now is to keep on moving up through uh, the, the difficulty levels. And I'm more chill than that. So I just like to hang out and, and chat with y'all when I play a game. Anyway, that's it for today. Thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good night.